podcast. Yeah. Beyonce was the first person. <laughs> like, Tyler, the creator, this, that. I'm like, I was like, so are you guys meant to be doing that? And they were like, well, I guess if you can get us the contacts, we could reach out. I was like, do you know that not all black people know each other, right? That's why I said to them. I had to tell them that. I literally wrote in the chat. They were like, <laughs> This week, I'm delighted to speak to supermodel and fashion designer, a woman who has worked for Victoria's Secrets, Tom Ford, Burberry, Fenty, and the list goes on. Born and raised in South London, a woman who has fought for representation in her industry through her brand, Lap. She's building a platform to speak on female empowerment, colonialism, climate change, and much, much more. She's much loved around the country, and she really is an inspiration to millions. It is, of course, Leomi Anderson. Hey, thank you so much for having me, Kate. I'm so excited for this conversation. Oh, so happy to have you here. What's good? What's happening? What's new? Oh, what's new? My outfit. Oh, what Ooh. is this? It's beautiful, actually. <laughs> it's new lap. Oh, dropping of course. Today. Or should I say just dropped? Because, wait, do I say it's just dropped? Because it's on the mm, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm wearing new lap, just dropped. Go out and grab some. Well, you don't have to. Oh. Everybody else does though, if you're listening. Love it, love it, love <laughs> it. I applaud you. Now, Leomi, tell me about this brand. Tell me about Lap. Tell me what you've had to go through to get this article, this beautiful article that you're wearing. How, how did we get here? <laughs> oh, I could cry blood. Let's oh. just say that. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's been hard. It's been hard. Oh. Um, so I founded Lap in 2016 because I had my own personal blog called Crack China Cup. And I used to do a lot of like fashion posts, talk a lot about the industry on there. But then somebody approached me and said, Leomi, could you write something for your young female followers about the pressures that young girls are under to send nudes or explicit images of themselves? Oh and I kind of felt a duty to, to put something else out there because, you know, being a model, it's very easy just to post a picture of yourself or a selfie or whatever. But I wanted to put out something that really connected with my younger female followers. And so I wrote this post and it went viral. And I realized that actually I could speak on something that's not to do with fashion and get a positive response. And once I realized that I can talk and people are going to listen, <laughs> you're not going to shut me up. And so um, I was able to go to schools. I went to an all girls secondary school and I was just asking them, you know, like if you were looking for a piece of advice or you wanted a perspective on something and you didn't feel comfortable maybe speaking to a parent or a teacher, who would you go to? And a lot of the girls were like, oh, like my friends or whatever. And I'm like, listen, if your friend is showing her teenage boobs, she's going to tell you to show your teenage boobs. Mm -hmm. So you need to go somewhere and basically have a hub of information. And so that was kind of the birth of Lap the Brand. And obviously it's evolved now. It's athleisure wear, um, as well as the online magazine. But that was basically the core of why I started the platform. But then since then, you know how business goes. Businesses are just like, oof, I've been getting beaten up. So many obstacles. Oh, but it's good because I've learned a lot. So we'll, we'll come back to all the lessons that you've learned. It's really, really fantastic to hear that you've been able to not only resonate with the public, but with young girls, because that's really who you were targeting your letter at. Can you tell us a bit about any of the backlash that you experienced? Oh, so actually with that particular piece that I put out, I feel like it was quite well received, but that's not always the way at all. Um, I feel like some of the things that I've spoken about in regards to the fashion industry and the treatment of black models has received um, mixed responses because some people, um, they felt like as a black model, I should be grateful for anything that's given to me anyway. Obviously, like a lot of like the Daily Mail readers and like the comment section mm -hmm. of that, for example, was definitely saying, you know, why is she complaining about being a model? You know, if she has so much to say, she should just go back to her own country. And I'm just like, I am in my own country, mate. I was born down the road. But um, yeah, I, I don't really care though, because for me, it's very important to just... If you feel something and you feel very passionate about it, you need to say something. I think it's really important, as you rightfully said, you know, you're born and bred here. You're a black model and, you know, you've been asked to represent a brand. So when you end up, you know, in backstage getting ready, you would expect to have the support that's needed. Yeah. So what would you say to an up and coming black model or model of colour? What would be their toolkit 
to, you know, get around those issues which you found when you started out? Um, I think it's very much um, a lot of patience and understanding that not everybody who's ill-equipped is someone who's ignorant or seeing Mm. you as a second thought. Sometimes people are just not educated enough. And as much as that's, I don't even like saying that, to be honest, because at this point, YouTube is right there. Like you can definitely learn so much about doing black makeup, black hair, Mm -hmm. how to, you know, make us look as good as our white counterparts look. But I feel like every situation you have to approach it like, okay, let me just have my makeup bag ready with me. So that way, if I'm not liking how I look, I can just vocalize that and say, hey, like this is the shade that I usually wear. Can you Mm -hmm. use this, you know, and have those conversations. The worst thing that I think you can do is be silent and just like be there with that egg on your face, looking like one ashy ass ghost. Go and fix it, go and sort it, go and have the conversations because I feel like that helps the makeup artist or Mm -hmm. the hairdresser as well. So that's my advice. I think that's fantastic advice. But a lot of what you're saying is about the individual. How can we collectively make a difference? Those of us who are outside of the fashion industry, not that I wouldn't mind getting in there, but you know. (laughs) (laughs) But whilst I'm on the outside, you know, there'll be people that are listening and watching thinking, how can we help? What do we need to do in our given industries um, to make Make sure that there's more awareness because a lot of people would not think that if you are, being, you know, you've been asked to walk, you're there, you're feeling really, you know, infused, you're excited and maybe a little bit intimidated, let's be honest. Mm. How do we help collectively to make sure that those young girls coming up get the support that's needed? I definitely think one of the main things that the the public and consumers of fashion can do is to keep having conversations and telling brands that you want to see people who look like you and you want to see them look good too. I feel like social media has been such a great tool Mm -hmm. for um, black voices within the industry or any minorities within the industry, actually, because before it was very idolized to like be mysterious and not speak up, you know, like Kate Moss's favorite phrase or whatever, never complain, never explain or something. I don't know. Well, well, whatever. I'm complaining and I'm explaining because, Mm. yeah. And I feel like when the public started putting pressure on brands, that's when they started to act up actually and act differently and move accordingly because they realized, oh, I don't want to be canceled. Oh, maybe this diversity thing is an issue that's not going to go away because it's been spoken about a lot, but only once it really settled on social media amongst the public did brands really start to make a difference, you know? Yeah, that's very, very true. And when we think of brands like Fenty, think of Rihanna and what she has done for the market and done for black women. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Is, is amazing. So love she's, her. yeah, of 100%. We love her. Never met her, but I mean, she's basically shown all other makeup um, companies look, this is what can be done. Yeah. Because she's got every color. Yeah. <laughs> There's no exactly. excuse. <laughs> Exactly. And that's what I mean. It's because the consumers celebrated that that launch so much that other brands were like, oh, okay, we really do need to take note. It wasn't because of just one individual model like myself, like mm-hmm. talking about it, or even someone as big as Naomi Campbell or Iman or anyone talking about mm-hmm. it. That wasn't enough. It was like them seeing the public eat up Rihanna's Fenty that they were like, oh, we're going to copy it. And now diversity is cool, you know? Exactly. So can you tell us a little bit about that launch? Oh yeah, that was fab. Fenty launch. <laughs> that was fab. I love working with Rihanna. I've known her for a really long time now, actually. Oh. And I can't lie, every year, pretty much somehow, she's putting money in my pocket. So I can always appreciate that. Thank you, Rihanna. I love you. Oh, she's that's wonderful to hear. She's so supportive. Mm. So supportive of all black models and all minority models as well. And... With her and being a part of that launch, I feel like we all knew on set that it was going to be something that was going to be monumental. Not just because it was her, but because we looked around and we were like, wow, like, okay, this is my first time even shooting with a hijabi model when I shot with Halima Aiden. Wow. Um, you know, you had Slick Woods, Shaved Head, Gap Tooth. Like, you would never see someone who looked like Slick in a makeup campaign or someone with a chocolate complexion like Ducky Thought. Like, we all were looking at each other like, oh my gosh, this is going to be amazing, you know? Not because it's Rihanna, not just because it's Rihanna, but... Yeah because this is going to have a huge impact. And so the excitement was real. And obviously when it finally came out and everyone saw the images and the videos and everything, the reception was amazing. But for me, the most amazing thing was knowing in my heart that finally I know these brands are going to switch up now that she's dropped this, you know, and I've been dealing with it for long and so open about it for so long as well that I was like, yes. Oh, it's fantastic to hear. Can you tell us about any other momentous um, occasion Oh where you've worked with another designer or makeup artist or anybody. Oh my gosh, there's so many. I don't even know where to start. But I would definitely say one of my 
probably one of my most favorite experiences because I feel like I 100% have to be the only person in the world that's done this. <laughs> um, basically, um, I worked with this hat designer, Philip Tracy, mm -hmm. and he was doing his first show in 10 years. He's like a huge hat designer that's yeah. hats for all the people, Lady Gaga, the Royals, blah, 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 right? And so I was his fit model. So I spent three weeks every single day at his studios, watched him make all the hats, etc. But the part that was very special was the fact that, um, I don't know if you remember, but there was um, an exhibition with all of Michael Jackson's like um, yes. costumes and clothes at the mm -hmm. DNA Museum. And he managed to get all of those to be the clothing for the show. Wow. And because I was the fit model, I got to try on every single piece. I'm talking like the jacket from like Bad, his diamond gloves, like everything. Any any of his, anything that was at the V&A Museum, I got to try it on. And to be able to say that is like, for me, just amazing. I love that. That is dresses. amazing. You know what I mean? That's yeah, it. it's those moments. It's a moment, isn't it? As yeah. opposed to, I walked on this, you know, in this show. Exactly. Which of course is fantastic as well, but it's those moments. But we've jumped in and we've talking and we're we're in, we're now, you know, years in. But I would like us to go back a little bit oh, and for you to tell us about how it all started. Who found you? Where were you? What was you doing? <laughs> I was coming home from school looking a hot mess. <laughs> I don't even know what they saw. I think it was obviously the height. I've always been tall. Yeah. I feel like I've been this height forever. I don't even remember being tall. <laughs> so that's strange. I feel like maybe like eight onwards I feel like I've been this tall but um, I was coming home from school and this Canadian guy came up to me and was like oh hey have you ever considered doing modeling and he had like a bag of McDonald's or something in his hand mm -mm. I was just like um, <laughs> stranger danger who's this and I like ran away and then the next day he came back and I was like oh my god no, guys <laughs> who is this man somebody come and arrest him no I'm joking then he was like no don't run he said don't run I was like whoa that's what you know that's yeah. not the right thing to say <laughs> and he was like no give this business card to your mom and I saw like Naomi Campbell's picture on it because um, she'd been signed to um, Premier my my, my first agency for like 17 years. And I was like, oh, this looks professional. Mm. But I still never called. I was only 14. So I was like, ah, I'm sure I'll call them in two years when I'm about to go to uni. Like I was mm. not thinking about modeling. But then somebody else from the same agency came up to me like maybe three months later. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe I'll give these people a call. Like I was not like enthused like yeah. that because in my head I was like well I'm still so young I can't work anyways I thought like I didn't know people could like have jobs mm -hmm. did you ages. did you take this back to mom or dad did you speak yeah. to family what did they say they're just like do you want to do it I was just like mm, just call them and let's see and they were like okay that was it and then I remember on the day I felt so sick and I was just like oh I can't be bothered to go and my mom was like look you can't she, she basically tried to teach me a lesson of like you can't organize a meeting with people and then just like say <laughs> oh, I feel sick and can't go yeah. So then I went again, looking a fool, fake Gucci belt, but come on, that was fashion. <laughs> and my little Primark pattern tights and Prime yeah, money. yeah, come on, <laughs> exactly. And yeah, and then I walked in and I got signed that day, and that's pretty much the start of my career. Oh, that's fantastic! It's really nice to hear that mom was there, just saying it's up to you, yeah. as opposed to maybe pulling you away from it, because that could happen as well. Mm. So she saw something in you. So big up to mum. Yeah, Look where you are did. now. She did. She did. So. But she always did tell me, these people are not your friends. That was the first oh. thing that she said to me when we were at the agency still. And then they brought it up like a year later, like, by the way, we heard your mum when she said that we weren't your friends. We <laughs> love her. I was just like, oh, Ooh. she don't love you. <laughs> <laughs> well, she was worried. I mean, you were very young. So what happened when you went on your first job? Was you was it in the UK? Yeah, the job? yeah. yeah. I, my first job was probably something. Well, I had a few test shoots, but I was only ever really allowed to do those on weekends. I couldn't really miss school. I'd say the first job that I missed school for was um, like half a day, and I was like a, a, a makeup mannequin for Mac. So when they're doing like they they do like events and stuff for their staff, yeah. and show them different makeup looks, oh. and products and stuff. Right. I was just like sitting in a chair doing my, get my makeup done, and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm a model. This is so amazing. I've arrived. Yes, <laughs> I've arrived. Probably got paid like seventy pounds or something, but I was like, this is fab. <laughs> oh wow. So I mean, you're still at school. You're fourteen. So at what age were you able to really be a model? I would say when I turned 17 mm -hmm. or, 
yeah, that year when I turned 17, that was the first year that I went to New York for Fashion Week. And that's when I would say that my career properly started to take shape. Because prior to that, um, it was more of a slow burn, shall we mm. say, because I wasn't trying to miss school. And London wasn't really a thriving market for black models anyway. So you mm -hmm. could do like your test shoots and stuff like that. And you can get like odd jobs, but like if you really want to make it, yeah. you have to go to New York. And so that's what I did. And I couldn't even walk. So let's just start there. <laughs> Don't know how I uh, survived that. I only booked one show, but that one show was marked by Mark Jacobs. So that was enough to carry me. Carry you through. So what, <laughs> and what the was that? <laughs> Oh, that helped. Yeah. Not stilettos. <laughs> Single heel is difficult. Yeah. So what what was that like, your experience in New York? Had you been there before at 17? No, that was oh. my first time, like, going. I'd been to, I think I'd briefly maybe been there as a child that I don't remember. Yeah. Because I have, you know, like those distant family of kind of relatives or whatever. I did not remember it at all. So when I went, it was a completely new experience. And I remember sitting on the plane being like, oh my gosh, I bet the house that I'm staying in is just so cool. I bet there's pictures of like all the big models on the walls and all this sort of stuff. <sighs> oh, we had roaches, mice, a brown ring around the tub and bunk beds. Oh, so it was very rough. Oh, it <laughs> was rough. Oh, it was rough. It was very much giving um, model hostel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Is that quite normal, would oh. you say? That is normal. And it's so funny because I remember coming back from that experience and going to college and people were like, oh my gosh, so like, what hotel were you staying in? And I started laughing. I said, hotel, is that what you think that this is? Who's paying for that? Me. Everyone, okay. that's the thing. So what is the setup? So if you go out on a job, would you have to pay for it eventually? Okay. Out of your, or is, so the agency doesn't set it up for you and pay for it. This is what it is. So when it comes to... Fashion week, for example, there's no guarantee that you're going to get a job, right? So what they'll do is they'll pay the upfront costs. They're going to pay for your flight. They'll pay for your book. And um, they'll pay for your accommodation, which is actually sometimes a scam because they own the accommodation sometimes. So let's just start there. And it's not cheap. I was paying like $1,600 to share a room with four people in a house of 12 people. Oh so we're all paying $1,600 to live in literally, like, nasty, not great conditions. Did you phone home? Were you able to tell mum what was going on? Yeah, but oh well, what can you do? Oh. <laughs> and it, I didn't see it as a bad thing. I just saw it as, oh, okay, cool. Like, this is just, it is what it is. I'm not one of those overly glamorous people I understood that mm, I need to make money and then when I make money I'm not staying here that was just my mentality and I remember other girls who were you know more well off and stuff some of them left like there was girls if you guys watched the the model agency documentary that I was on yes for my first show season actually or was it my second whatever no it's my first um yeah, she left. Like, she couldn't handle it. She left, like, before Fashion Week even started. Her mum flew from London to come and collect her and bring her back. Do you think my mum was doing that? No. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, it's money. Oh, it's no. over the top. That's OTT, yes. So, but... I mean, what happened? I mean, in the sense that you've gone out there, you're 17, you're staying in a, a very nasty accommodation. How long would you say it took for you to be able to go out to New York and not <laughs> be in that accommodation? Years. 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 I would say that, uh, like... For the first 17 to 19 was model apartments mm -hmm. for sure. Then I moved on up and I was <laughs> renting a room from the daughter of uh, the person who owned my agency in London. She lived in New York. So she had like a little small cute place, uh, had a window that faced the brick wall. Like, you know, you know yeah. the vibes. It yeah. wasn't like <laughs> amazing, but no. I wasn't sharing with anybody. Yes. So that was the main thing. And then I got my first actual place there, like renting it by myself when I was 21. So it's not easy at all. Like you really have to build your way up and get a lease and all that sort of stuff. You need to be earning 30 or 40 times the rent to be able to rent in New York. So that's a lot of money. So Liami, would you say that it's really difficult for black working class children to get into um, the career of being a model? Do you want to know what? I would say that Modeling is actually one of the few industries where if it's meant to be for you, it doesn't really matter what background you're from, as long as you have your head screwed on and you can persevere. I wouldn't say it's easier for you to, to get into these positions because we see it. We see all the people who are daughters of, you know, celebrities and stuff like that who just get to like jump a lot of steps. They're not going to be staying in a model apartment. However, 
if you're from a working class background and you're a young girl who is thinking about modeling, mm-hmm. you just need to ask yourself a couple of questions like, can you handle rejection? Are you easily led? How ma- how badly do you want this? And why do you want this? Mm-hmm. Because, um, yeah, I think it's an industry where actually you can do incredibly well no matter what your background is, but you have to be smart. Like, you can't just think, oh, because I'm pretty, I'm mm-hmm. going to be amazing and everything's going to be great. Nah, there's a million pretty people out there, trust me. And So there are a lot of women or girls that you started out with that have continued or do a lot just drop out? You'd be surprised. I have a variety of different people who have ended up in multiple different situations. I have people who I was best friends with who live on Skid Row now, which I don't think would have ever happened if they just carried on having a normal life. I have friends who, do you know what I mean? I have friends who somehow modeling didn't work out and they were like illegal immigrants bussing tables in New York because their visa was for their modeling agency and they got dropped. Like, And then I have girls who I've known for years who have families, who are, you know, really well off, married, kids still modeling, like stocks, bonds, houses, like everything. Like I know every type of person. And that's why I say you really have to have your head screwed on because it can really, you can really be on skid row. Mm. (laughs) I'm not even joking. I don't want anyone to underestimate that. I can imagine. And has there ever been a situation that you felt compromised in at all that you could talk about or you don't have to? Mm, You want to know what it is with with me and modeling? I feel like I've definitely been in situations where um, I felt like I didn't have a voice or I didn't necessarily have agency over my body. Whether it's a photographer who like touches you inappropriately or tries to put you in like a very like compromising position. But I, I'm i not afraid to like just run to the toilets and call my agency and be like, I don't like this. Can you guys call them and sort it out? Mm-hmm. Not a lot of, not every girl is like that. I wouldn't say not a lot, but some girls, it takes them a while to find their voice, you know. But for me, I've always had it. Like the the first time when I went to New York and they were telling me they wanted to cut my hair into a Rihanna asymmetric bob. Ooh. Ooh, as in they already <laughs> booked the appointment, everything. The first time I met them, the way I called my agency, because I'd explained to them, you know that this whole cutting black hair thing, I've already explained to you guys, we're not dealing with that. Mm. So yeah. But again though, a lot of girls don't have that, that confidence in themselves yet. And the industry often takes advantage of that. They actually benefit so much from keeping girls clueless and keeping Mm. them feeling like they should be grateful for the opportunity you know so this confidence that you speak about where where did it come from where would you say it came from (sighs) I actually don't really know I guess from my mum from my mum when I was younger she always made me feel very confident being tall I was always doing different things whether it's dance theater gymnastics languages instruments like I did everything when I was younger like anything that I said to my mum I was even remotely interested in Mm -hmm. she would find a way for me to be able to explore whether it was something that I liked and that was the same approach that she took with modeling so that's why for me it was very much that like if I don't like it anymore I can stop at any point and just do something else I don't feel obligated to to take rubbish from the industry you know because I was like well I've got my A-levels I've got two A's and a B I can go uni if I want to or I can do this or that I didn't feel tied into being a model yeah so I think that's what gave me the confidence to be like okay I can do this but I didn't always have my voice I didn't always know how to use it the confidence was always within me but I didn't know exactly when to apply it with the modeling industry and I feel like for the first few years I did allow what my agents um, were trying of training you to believe to be true that I should be grateful that this is just normal you know you are going to be disrespected because you're new and eventually you'll become a big time model and you won't have to deal with this anymore but I started to realize okay that's cool but actually the experiences of me as a black model versus a white model who's coming up at the exact same time as me is completely different and that's when I started figuring out okay I need to say something now because it's not just oh yeah everyone who's starting in the beginning is being treated the same that's not true we were being treated way worse from you know being told um you know, the darker that you are, oh, this client's not going to want you, you're dark. Like, that was normal. Like, you know, I remember, and that that was normal in the UK, in America, anywhere that you went. But in Europe, they would 
outrightly just be saying to to black girls like or saying it in Italian and speaking amongst each other that black girls oh she's ugly she's burnt and the thing is there'll be other models in the room who spoke Italian like white models black models as mm. well and everyone would be like oh my god but nobody would say anything and then mm. afterwards I remember being like why was your face like like what did he say and she was like I don't really want to say it and I'm like just say it and he was like yeah he was saying that the black models they're burnt they're ugly they're this they're that that was normal and I realized what am I holding my, why am I holding my words in? Why am I holding in how I feel when all that happens is like, I'm going to go home and feel upset within myself or I'm going to go to the mm. toilets and cry about my makeup and my hair. No. So I realized from then I need to be vocal because I don't want other young black girls to go through that. That's really important as to hear. And so the turning point would be when you realize there was levels of racism that was taking yeah, place yeah. behind the scenes. Yeah, I would definitely say that was one of the, <clears throat> the eye-opening things for me because I just knew, like, I'd cried so many tears. Like, I'd cried so <clears throat> many tears from little microaggressions, like them refusing to change the sh shade of, like, the lipstick to suit you. So mm. I'm looking literally, like, wearing, like, lipstick that's no. this shade and saying, can you maybe find my own tone? And then being like, we know it's hard for you to accept your features, but, you know, this is the look. And I'm like, it's not about my features. I just don't like this color, you know? Mm. But, like, from little things like that at a young age, and I'm realizing... I didn't say anything when they were saying that because all I said was, I don't have a problem with my features. Mm. But really, now I would have gone off. Do you yes. know what I mean? Yes. But it took a bit of time to get to that level of confidence. And also, I realized very early on that if you are going to speak up, you have to be smart. You can't just single out one particular brand or say a particular designer's name because they're going to be then used as a scapegoat when really it's actually a much bigger issue that they are also a part of that's being upheld by a whole system that spans even further outside of the fashion industry, you know? Um, and I always wanted to make that point that, yes, I'm speaking about fashion, but this is being upheld by society. Like, what I'm talking about is a mirror reflection of what is happening in society. And once I realized that there was ways to speak on issues that can make people open their minds and think and not just be like, oh, is that person there? That's yeah. when I really <clears throat> said, okay, I get it now. Well, that's really important that from what you're saying is that you're understanding that it's the institution. It's yeah. not just, you know, one individual brand yes. or one individual makeup artist or hair, you know, hair, hair, hairdresser. But is there a collective of you that understand that and can kind of tell each other how to speak or have you learned from making a mistake? Um, to be honest with you, maybe I'll look back and be like, Liam, you should have said that, but I haven't <laughs> stepped. I, have, I can't lie. Once I started speaking, I knew how to step. I yeah. like, I like, I like English. I like writing. Yeah. I like talking, as you can tell. Exactly. So for me, yeah. And for me, it was like, I have the tools to be able to speak on this. And a lot of black models, they would come to me up after shows and during shows and be like, Leomi, if you do an interview, can you talk about this? And, um, you know, that's what it was. So I was just kind of like, okay, this is who I am now. And this is kind of what I do. Because from young, I was always that model who had my makeup kit, for example, mm. when the models would come to me, oh, can you help me fix my makeup? That's always been me. So it just felt very natural to me. So I don't feel like I necessarily made a mistake and I don't regret anything that I've spoken on. Mm. Even if it rubbed people the wrong way, I, I don't care. Yeah, I no, you, you haven't made no mistakes. You've actually let other people know what's going on. Yeah, that, you, you're that's definitely it. an ambassador. Um, would you say you found your purpose in modeling, in, in yeah, life? <laughs> yeah, you want to know what? Yeah, I feel like um, without modeling, I wouldn't have had all these experiences and I wouldn't have had all the both the good and the bad that have shaped me to be who I am today. And I feel like I've kind of, it was definitely meant to be. I was definitely meant to be approached by Anthony with the McDonald's. Love you. If you oh, watch oh, this, lovely. still speak with him. Like, love him to death. Um, but yeah, it was definitely meant to be for me because I don't think that I'm ever going to make my name off of like just being a model. Like that's just not me. Mm. I'm not going to be the model who's walking like 50 shows a season and stuff like that. Like I'm 29 now. I did my first show season 17 years ago. Like if I, if I ain't got it yet, then it's cool. It's fine. <laughs> you missed out on this. But holler if you were. No, <laughs> no but, but you know what I mean? And I'm, I'm yeah, fine with that. You understand but, yeah, that. Yeah, I understand that. And I'm happy about that because one thing that I always didn't like about the industry was that it was not about hard work and merit. It was just like all over the place. You could mm. just wake up one day and you could have a contract that's worth 
a million dollars, well, for some people. Mm. <laughs> or you could wake up and like nobody wants you. Or you could wake up and that hairstyle that they forced you to get is not cool anymore. And okay, no one cares, mm. you know? So, and I didn't like that. I like hard work equals results. That's the type of person yeah. that I am. And that's the one part of the industry that it's never going to change because it is an industry that on the, the most basic level is about how you look. So... And that's fine, but I like having a lot more going on. Well, I think it's important that you make that clear that, you know, if you're a model, you still got to have your side hustles as oh, well. Yeah. Because if you don't, you could end up falling foul to all of those horrible things. Mm -hmm. But Or you... marry well. Yes. There you go. Well, <laughs> you can't marry well. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> but <laughs> let's, let's work on merit. Let's work on merit. So have you written all this down? Is there a manual? Is there something we can pick uh, up and hand out? Roll up, roll up. The, this, uh, the pros want, and cons. You want to know what's so funny? Like, I do think about <laughs> this often, actually. Like People do say that I should write a book. I'll get there eventually. I'll get there eventually. But for now, just I, I have to keep doing things like this. I love speaking to people like you and being able to oh, just speak on the, these experiences and also get a different way of being asked about the experiences as well. And how I'd speak to you would be different to how I speak to like a particular journalist or yeah. whatever, whatever, you know. And that's why for me, it's just important to just keep on talking. So yeah, love it. Great. Yeah, no, oh, thank you so much. And it's really important. But if you say you're going to write the book, are you writing the notes now for the book? Oh, you want to know what? I think that the day that I decide to do a book, I just need to set up a little voice dictator thing and I just need to talk, 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 talk and then go <laughs> back over it because, yeah. But I am actually writing a script at the moment. So oh, interesting. And what, yeah. what is the script on? Being oh, a model? Or? Yeah, actually, I'm, I want to do a, a series. I want to do a series. Not like a docuseries, like mm -hmm. a fictional series, but based on my actual real life of when I lived in New York. It's spicy. Yeah, well, that's oh well. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, um, thank and you. I hope hopefully you've got some takers. You have got production house. Oh, I've got I've got Randy Ankles. I've got a couple people. I know you can't say too much now. Yeah, I've got a couple people who are hollering. But uh, if you're watching this and you're interested, call me. Yes. Or oh. you're listening to this, call me. Exactly. Oh, yeah, I can't do the whisper. Need them to hear that. No, exactly. <laughs> no, it's really important, and I hope that you are taking notes and you're making sure that all these little experiences are written down somewhere or they're somewhere yeah you know? they're going somewhere a hundred percent and that's they're, really they're important somewhere. because we can't we need your legacy to be something which kept, carries on and on and on and on because you did kick down a couple doors to get where you are thank you thank you very much so that's that's really really good so as we sort of come to a close I just wanted to ask you a few questions quick fire ones yeah. so Leomi who has inspired you Oh, okay. So I would be anyone, live or dead. <laughs> oh my gosh, alive or dead. Oh, you've opened up the can of worms there. <laughs> no, I would say um, one of my biggest inspirations um, when it comes to business has to be obviously Rihanna, but also Emma Grede or Greed. Greedy? Yeah, Emma Greedy. She's the co founder of um, Good American and Skims with the Kardashians. But mm. what people don't know is that actually she's black, she's British. She founded one of the biggest fashion agencies when she was 24 years old, sold that. And then pitched the concept of Good American to the Kardashians. Wow. So it was her concept Innovator. and her idea. Yeah, exactly. And that's, she's a hustler. So Emma, that's one of my biggest inspirations. Mm. Because when it comes to business, I need to be on the cover of Forbes like this. Exactly. And for those listening, I'm <laughs> smiling with my arms folded. <laughs> exactly. It's what it's all about. Yes. So, Leomi, tell me, what barrier did you have to kick down and you want removed? So no one has mm. to go through what you uh, went through. I would definitely say the the prejudice and the prejudices and the subconscious idea that um being black and having a voice is a negative thing mm -hmm. because I feel like in many spaces um they like having black people there for the look but they don't necessarily like it when you speak up or if you can speak better than them on a particular subject or if you're more knowledgeable than them in a particular subject you know I've been in a lot of spaces where I can see that they feel intimidated or they they feel even angered sometimes by the fact that I am so vocal and that I don't 
feel uncomfortable when they stare or, you know, question me. I just answer the question and I get back to it, you know. So I think that that would be one barrier that I would like removed because we already have so many obstacles and intersections that we as Black women have to face and overcome and navigate around. I would hate to to see an, another generation have to go through, you know, sitting in a room and being questioned on how intelligent you are, how much you know on some, know about something yeah. simply because of the color of your skin. I think that's something so many people can resonate with. Mm-hmm. Um, and one thing, and a lot of people say, there's lots of quotes out there where white people want to take our culture, want to take our fashion, but they don't want to speak up when we're going through pain. Mm. You know, there's all different versions mm-hmm. to that, but... It, it's we're not here as as a showcase. This is our reality. Oh, we yes. should be able to speak on it. Exactly. Um, so definitely, I, I like that last one that you've just said. And and can you tell us um, what moment do you think defined your success? Oh, for me personally, mm. that moment was when I was able to rent my own place. <laughs> No, yeah, big. literally. It's yeah, That's that massive. was it. I think that when I was able to like run my own place in New York, I was spinning around like Carrie Bradshaw. Didn't matter that it was in Harlem, op- opposite a flipping <laughs> men's homeless shelter. Ooh, ooh. Were, oh, yeah. Well, no, you want to know the funniest part? So I thought that I had a concierge, and they were like, oh, I'm a security guard. I just like. <laughs> I was Keeping like, you safe. Yeah, I was like, oh, so if my packages come, you don't collect it. He was like, nah. I was like, oh, okay. Oops. I'd already signed a year lease at that point, but I loved it. No, I love living in Harlem. Yeah, the I loved time it. there. Yeah, it was sick. It was sick. But I would say that that for me was like, oh, wow, I've done it. Yeah, it's a massive moment. Yeah. You know, and you're still very young. So well done. Well done Thank for you. that. Um, you spoke a little bit briefly about grandma um, and that she used to feed you. So yeah. can you tell us a dish that you love that grandma made and what it means oh, to you? Oh gosh. Um, my grandma probably makes one of the best soups. Mm. Like the best soups with, you know, like a little mutton, some dumplings and, you know, the good old hard food. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, I would say that means a lot to me because it's just like a comfort. It's one of those foods that like when I came home, from like a long stretch in New York or whatever, like if my mum or my grandma made like soup, I was just like, oh, I'm home, you know? So soup, grandma soup means home. Yes. Oh, thank you so much. Thank Thank you you so much for having me, Kate. Appreciate you. Appreciate you too. Take care. Thank you so much. Liam Anderson. (laughs) (laughs) Ba-dum-ch.